It's uh, great to be with you all this morning. I'm glad that you found your way here, that we found each other this morning. Hopefully nobody got too lost uh, this morning, Pearl Studios. I'm sorry, Jade, but you're here, and you were on time. And uh, Pearl Studios is like one Sunday a year. They have no availability, so we had to find somewhere else. But it's a great room to be in, and it's been great worshiping God. Prince said that his address was taking him to the middle of the U.S. I'm glad you didn't go there. Uh, you'd be on your way still, probably. But uh, hopefully everybody is having a great start to your new semester and first weeks of school, and January's almost over, which is crazy. Uh, but uh, I'm excited for this morning. We're going to dig into the Bible this morning. Does that sound good? As you all know, we're going through the book of Acts, and last Sunday we had... Stephen O'Guire come, he preached on Acts chapter 15, which is a very important chapter, and today we're going to look at the first 15 verses of Acts chapter 16. Come on, Rob. So you can turn over to Acts chapter 16, and uh, we'll be digging into uh, that, that first half of the chapter today. So you know, uh, you know, in, in the chapters we read recently, Paul and Barnabas and some of uh, the other disciples on a team, they just finished going around on their first mission trip, planting and strengthening churches. Y'all remember that? Yep. Yep. Great. So then five years goes by, and now in Acts chapter 16, they're starting their second go-around. Right. So they're going out on a second trip to go plant some new churches and go back to some of those young five-year-old churches that they had started on the first trip to see how they were doing to encourage and strengthen and help them to mature. And something that just consistently inspires me throughout the book of Acts, and in chapter 16 it's as apparent as it is anywhere else, is that in the book of Acts you see that the church is meant to be an exciting place. That the church is meant to be a place where you just see God is changing people's lives. Where God is using people, where God is shaking things up, and that the church is to be a place where many people are being saved. And that's what we're trying to build when we just say build your church, right? That's what we're trying to build, and that's what we're trying to be here for New York City. Amen? Amen. So as we look at Acts 16 today, the main focus we're going to be looking at and talking about is following God's will. That's the topic, the theme, the title for today, following God's will. How often do you wish you knew what God's will was in your life. All the time. Right? We, we, I hope you want to know that, right? How often do you wish you knew what the future was? Or should be, right? How many of you wish you knew, like, which plan you should follow out on, or which path to take, right? These are big questions, especially when you're younger, you're trying to figure a lot of stuff out. And so, my hope is that today we can all leave here aiming to find, to trust, and to follow God's plan for our lives. Amen? Amen. Amen. You know, the truth is, this should be our ambition for our lives and all of our decisions, right? To right. ask as we go through life, well, what does God want? What does God want me to do? And the reason we should be going to God for that direction, there's so many reasons, but some of the quick ones is, well, God made you. He created you, so he's a good person to go to to ask, well, what should I do, Right? God knows you, and this is so important for us to know this. You need to know this. God knows you better than anyone. Yeah. And you might think, oh, my mom, right? And she might know you well. Oh, my sister, or my brother, whatever, or oh, my best friend. And those people might know you well, yeah. right? But the truth is God knows you better than anyone else does. Mm -hmm. He knows what you like. He knows how you feel. He knows what will fulfill you and what, what won't. He knows how you'll respond to things. He knows the hurt that you've experienced or what would hurt you. He knows your past better than anyone. Where you could sit down and try to recount your, your life or past to somebody, but God saw it all. He was there for it all. And he not just saw what happened on the outside, but knew what you were going through on the inside. He knows your present, what your day yesterday, this morning was like better than anyone else that is here, you have not even time to tell them yet, God already knows. He knows your future better than anybody because you and nobody else knows your future. God knows you better than anyone. And so, finding and following God's will is the best decision for our lives. Does that make sense? Yeah. 
So we're going to look at Acts 16, verse 1 to 15, for three ways to find and follow God's will. Amen? Amen. The first one is that you find God's will through selflessness. Okay. That you'll find God's will for your life through focusing less on yourself. Acts chapter 16, let's so start with verses 1 to 5. It says, Paul came to Derb and then to Lystra, where a disciple named Timothy lived, whose mother was Jewish and a believer, but whose father was a Greek. The believers at Lystra and Iconium spoke well of him. Paul wanted to take him along on the journey, so he circumcised him because of the Jews who lived in that area, for they all knew that his father was a Greek. As they traveled from town to town, they delivered the decisions reached by the apostles and elders in Jerusalem for the people to obey, referring to Acts 15. So the churches were strengthened in the faith and grew daily in numbers. Isn't that inspiring? Amen. So Paul planted this church and now years later comes back to strengthen it. And he meets Timothy and decides, man, this is an awesome young guy. The, the disciples there are saying, hey, this guy's great. You should take him with you. And I just want to make a side plug here that it's so important. It's so important that the church has young men and women being raised up for the future of the church. Yeah. To be strong disciples, to be leaders, to be using their gifts, to be leaning in like Timothy did. You know, Timothy grew up around the church, right? It says his mom was a disciple. He grew up around the church, but he made his faith his own, as many of you have as well. And the reality is that we need kingdom kids, people who grew up in the church. We need kingdom kids with their own passion for God and for building his kingdom. Mm -hmm. And I'm grateful to be part of a room of many of you that have taken your parents' faith and made it your own. But the main focus here is Timothy does something radical here. And I know the guys in the room noticed it. But Timothy does something <laughs> radical here. You know, it's like, hey, man, come on the journey with me. All right, sounds good. But first, yeah. we got to take care of something here. <laughs> you know, as an adult male without modern tech or medicine, yeah. Timothy is circumcised to go on this mission team. And the funny thing about it is Acts 15, the message they go around letting everybody know about, Acts 15 was all about how you don't need to follow the Jewish law and be circumcised anymore to be a Christian. So Timothy probably thinking, oh good, I'm in the clear now. And then Paul has him do this to go with him on this trip. So a big question is why? Why did this have to be done? And the reality, the, the reason is because the Jews who lived in that area who they were going to be evangelizing to, they didn't agree with this verdict yet. They didn't agree that you didn't need to be circumcised to be one of God's people. And so Timothy would be more effective saving the lost and have a bigger impact by doing this than if he didn't. Mm. And so he was willing to do so. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. That was Timothy's heart, to take one for the team to be more effective for others. You know, Philippians 2, 19 to 22 gives us insight into Timothy's heart. What made him stand out to everybody so much? Well, it says here, this is Paul writing, I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon, that I also may be cheered when I receive news about you. I have no one else like him who will show genuine concern for your welfare. For everyone looks out for their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. And so we see what made Timothy different, and it was his selflessness. Now, like Timothy, God is calling us to be people who aren't like everyone else, who go through life looking out first and foremost for their own interests. But to be like Timothy, who are looking out for, well, what is God's interests? Amen. What's God's will? What does God want? And there's a lot of aspects to God's will. But a big part of what God's will is, is said in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 3 to 4. It says, this is good and pleases God our Savior who wants all people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. Amen. Right? That's, that's probably God's greatest will, is that you would be saved, that you would be right with Him, that you'd have a relationship with Him, that you would be in heaven forever with Him 
one day. And so if you're in this room and you haven't been saved yet, right? If you haven't fulfilled this by coming to faith, repenting, and being baptized, that's a great place to start if you want to follow God's will Amen. for your life. Because that's His biggest will for you. Yeah. But here's the thing. Timothy was willing to be circumcised because he knew it would make him more effective in carrying out God's will. And he cared more about God's will than maybe what he wanted in that moment. And so this made him exceptional to God. It made him exceptional to Paul and to many others. And so Timothy was able to follow God's will for his life. And so this morning, I want you to reflect on yourself. Will you be exceptional to God in this way? In the way that Timothy was, where you're willing to set aside your comfort. You're willing to set aside what's better for you for the sake of God's will. For the sake of what's better for others even, maybe. You know, maybe where you're willing to be uncomfortable inviting somebody to study the Bible or come to church with you. Where you're willing to sacrifice time of your life to be there for somebody else. Where you're willing to spend time doing something you don't like or learning about something else that somebody else likes so that you can be a better friend to them or relate to someone better. Right? This is the heart that Timothy had that we need to have as well. And as we see in Timothy, selflessness will lead us to finding God's will. But if we're selfish, we may never find God's will. Now, this is one of those paradoxes of Christianity. And there's a lot of them. But one of the ones Jesus says is that you've got to lose your life for him to find it. Yeah. That you find God's will by not living for yourself. And so the more we live and focus on ourselves, the farther we will be from what we were made for. And so we find God's will for our lives when we put God's interests before our own. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. You know, there's this line uh, that Cynthia Pallas said to Chelsea before and to many others. And this is what she lives by, which has led her to finding God's will in her life. Cynthia Pallas says, when you take care of God's business... He takes care of your business. Okay. Now, when you focus on, well, God, what do you want? Then God takes care of, well, what do you need? Jesus teaches us in Matthew 6. He says, you run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and the rest will be given to you as well. Now, Timothy is a great example of that. And so he was taken along with Paul. He planted churches. He helped many people get to heaven. He even has two books of the Bible named after him. He's mentioned in multiple other books of the Bible. Timothy was able to find and follow God's will because he didn't just live for himself, but for God and for others. And did that involve pain and discomfort? Yes. But it also led to him finding life to the full. <coughs> I want to close out this point with one more passage that I think is so important. On this point and on God's will, and it's Romans 12, verses 1 to 2. You guys with me? Yeah. This verse says, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is. His good, pleasing, and perfect will. Amen. You know, this verse is encouraging because it tells us, hey, God's will for your life, it is good, pleasing, and perfect. Amen for that, right? Amen. Yeah. So, Okay, God, can I trust you with your will, with your plan for my life? Well, this is saying yes. Mm. You can. He has good, pleasing, and perfect will. Do you believe that? Mm. Right? When you think about, okay, God, what's your plan? What's your will? Do you believe that whatever it is, that it is good, pleasing, and it's right? It's perfect. But this passage also tells us, well, how do we get there? How do we find God's will? How do we get to it? Well, it tells us that to get to it, we need to make sure that we don't conform to the patterns of this world. 
Instead, we need to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. We need to think differently. We need to rewire our minds from how the world thinks to how God thinks. The Bible calls this repentance. Right. A change of mind that leads to a change in life. And so how does the world think when thinking about making plans or thinking about, well, what should I do? Well, the way of the world, the way the world teaches us to think is, hey, you've got to live for yourself. You've got to put you first. Right. Do what feels right to you. Do what's best for you. Follow your truth. Follow your heart. But Jeremiah 17 verse 7 says, The heart is deceitful above all else. Who can understand it? How many of you made mistakes doing what you felt or thought was right? We all have, right? Because the heart is deceitful. God is more trustworthy than we are. Oh, amen. Behind all of these different thinkings of the world, really what's, what's at heart behind it is the thought of just be your own God. You be the God of your life. You call the shots. You worship, please, and praise you. But if any of us are thinking clearly, the reality is I don't want any of you to be my God. Right? Like, by the way, who's going to be the God of my life? I don't, I don't want any of you, and I'm sure none of you want me to be the God of your life. Yeah. I would not be a good God. Right? I don't want to be the God of my own life. I tried that already. Before I became a Christian... I called the shots in my life. I did things the way I felt, the way I wanted, the way I thought. A lot of times, I wasn't even thinking. I was just doing. Right. And that's sometimes how we could be when we're running our own lives. And where did that lead me? I was a mess with school. Right? I had a 2.6 or 2.9, I don't even remember, 2 point something grade point average in the middle of college. My relationships were falling apart. I couldn't keep one, and a lot of my friendships had a lot of pain in them. I did not know what to do with my life. My character was just weak, unreliable, dishonest. This is where I led myself when I was the God of my own life. But instead, when I made Jesus Lord of my life, when I made God the Lord, all those things began to change and to turn around to find His good, pleasing, and perfect will. And that's why Romans 12 says that, as we don't conform to the patterns of this world to find God's will, what do we need to do? In view of God's mercy, we offer ourselves as a sacrifice to God. Selflessness. We don't live for ourselves, we live for Him, and then we find God's will for our life. So this morning, whose will are you living for? Are you living for your own, or are you living for God's? And so let's find God's will that is good, pleasing and perfect through selflessness. Amen? Amen? And then secondly, find God's will through surrender. Okay. We're going to have to surrender sometimes to find God's will and to follow God's will for our life. And we see this in Acts chapter 16, verses 6 to 10. And so Paul's got Timothy with them now, and they keep going. So in Acts 16, verse 6 to 10, let's read this here. You guys with me? Yeah. 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 It says, Paul and his companions traveled throughout the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been kept, listen to this here, having been kept by the Holy Spirit from preaching the word in the province of Asia. When they came to the border of Mysia, they tried to enter Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus would not allow them to. So they passed by Mysia and went down to Troas. During the night, Paul had a vision of a man from Macedonia standing and begging him, Come over to Macedonia and help us. After Paul had seen the vision, we got ready at once to leave for Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. You now, have you ever had something in your life not go as planned? Yeah. Yeah. We all have, right? We were like, this is where I'm going. This is how it's going to play out. Here's the plan, right? And then it totally goes a different way. This happened for me in a huge way when I was 17. I had this crazy uh, idea. So Bobby Ritter and I grew up best friends. Our dads grew up friends. Uh, my uncle and his dad grew up friends. And when they were 17, they rode their bikes from out in Hope, New Jersey, where I grew up, all the way down to Long Beach Island, New Jersey. And so as many of you are not familiar with the geography of New Jersey, this is a long bike ride. This is over 120 miles. And when they were 17, they did it. So Bobby and I at 17, we said, we got to do this. 
I knew my mom wouldn't be fired up about it, so I didn't even tell her. I left a note on the kitchen counter and said, we're biking the LBI. My dad knew. I'll turn my phone on at 8 o'clock. We left at 2 a.m. There was no smartphones then. I had printed out uh, MapQuest directions. We couldn't ride on the highway, so we had to take all the back roads. MapQuest was this website where... Oh, no, yeah. I'm so, um, so this was a long bike ride. And we were biking across New Jersey, things, I don't have time to tell you all the things that did not go as planned. One of them was when we got to Princeton, we were supposed, there was a five way intersection and we were supposed to make one of the slight lefts and we made a different slight, slight left. And we went 13 miles in the wrong direction. Guys, this is biking, 13 miles. Like how many of you can even do that, okay? I had to turn around and go back, back 13 miles. Because I couldn't just, oh, redirecting. I only had my map quest. So we had to go back. Another thing that didn't go as planned was getting there in one day. So we had to find somewhere to sleep for the night. And there was a friend of a friend who lived in the Pine Barrens, down in the woods down here, super creepy. And uh, we crashed for the night at this woman's house. So multiple things did not go as planned. But we got there, we're still alive, and we have a lot of stories to tell from it. In Acts chapter 16 here, Paul and company, they're carrying out the mission. They're doing what God wants them to do, right? But then it says, the door shut on them. They were traveling up through Mysia. They get to the, the border of the next country they want to go into, and it says that the door got shut. And they had to go a completely different way. What you don't realize as you're going through it is, one, just how much distance is involved in all of this. But they're trying to go on their mission trip up into Bithynia, they're, they're traveling up this way, and this is where they had to turn around and backtrack to go a different way. This is a distance that they had to turn around and backtrack of 45 miles. Wow. So they went 45 miles trying to serve God for God to say, actually, we're going this way. They had to turn around, go back the other way. 45 miles is like walking from Coney Island to Yonkers to Flushing, turning around and then going back. Oh. Right? And this is back in the day. You know, th this is rough traveling conditions. But when God made it clear where he did want them to go, they redirected and set off that way at once. They could have questioned God. They could have complained. They could have given up. But instead, they surrendered and changed course. They went where God wanted them to go. Amen. Here's the thing. You likely have some plans for your life. Yeah. What major you have or want to have what career or job you hope to get after you graduate, maybe where you want to live, the timing of a relationship, or maybe who you want a relationship with. All of this stuff, you might have some plans for your life, and that could be good to have. But here's what's important is that underneath all of those plans, the foundational capital P plan should be whatever God's will for my life is. I think this, I want that, I think this is the right direction, but ultimately, I'm surrendered to God's will. Mm -hmm. Is that your plan? Is that your capital P plan? You know, like them, we need to plan. They had a route they were going. We need to plan. We need to be responsible with our life. We need to be proactive. Following God's will doesn't mean you wake up, sit on the couch, and go, well, when he makes me get up and go, then I'll follow, right? <laughs> you can't do nothing. You've got to do your best. Be responsible, but be open to letting God course correct you as you go. Ultimately, their aim was not to go to Bithynia. Ultimately, their aim was to follow God's will. Yeah. So when they found out God's will was different than their plan, they were okay changing their plan. And this could be hard for us. But we have to learn to surrender to God's plans and believe that they are better if we really want God's will to be followed in our lives. Right. Surrender. What does it mean to surrender? Surrendering means I am willing to go another way. Surrender means I will be content without fully knowing and fully understanding. Surrender means I'm okay not knowing exactly how this plays out. Surrender means I accept the way things turn out, even when it's hard, 
painful, inconvenient, or different than I expected. Surrender means I trust God with this and I don't need to be in control. Mm. When you think about it, how much control do we really have anyway, right? <laughs> so are you surrendered to God's plan for your life? Or are you trying to control and figure it all out yourself? Will you trust God when things don't go the way you expected or hoped? And ultimately, trust in God is the key to surrendering and finding His good, pleasing, and perfect will in our lives. And for me, I found that there's a lot of peace in surrendering as well. It can take a lot of the pressure off when I'm not sure what decision to make, what to do, what's next, to just go, you know what, God? You know, and I trust you with it, and I know you're going to take care of me and figure it out. It does bring a lot of peace when we surrender. And ultimately, we can surrender and trust God because God is sovereign because God is in control because God opens doors that nobody else can open and shuts doors that no one can shut mm -hmm. because when the doors close or the road turns we can go to him at any time in faith we can trust and surrender to be God because God knows more than we do he is just he is good and he loves you more than you love yourself or more than anybody else loves you mm -hmm. God is trustworthy to surrender to. And the reality is, we can look at this and go, wow, that was inconvenient. We can look at things in our life and go, man, why did this happen this way? Right. Why did this go different than I thought or than I wanted? This doesn't seem that this was painful or this, you know, was, was uncomfortable or whatever. But the truth is, there's so much we don't know. Yeah. Right? We don't know what would have happened if we kept going when God turned us. We don't know how things would have gone if he opened the door that we hoped he would have opened. We don't know, probably until we get to heaven, we'll look back and realize just how many things God saved us from that we didn't know along the way. And even already, we could all look at times in our life that God clearly knew better than we did and showed us his ability to take care of us. There's some things maybe you even prayed for that now you're glad God didn't answer. You know, you go, wow, God, thank you for always knowing better than I did. Mm -hmm. Remembering that stuff can strengthen our faith for the future. Yeah. Because God ultimately is the only one who knows the future. God knew what he was doing here when he redirected them. God knew the future. What happened as a result of them going a different way? Well, one big thing that happened was they gained Luke. Luke, who wrote the book of Luke, who wrote the book of Acts. If you notice, the text of the book of Acts changes from they to we in the paragraph that we just read. So rerouting and going a different way led to them meeting Luke and Luke joining their team. If they didn't go a different way, we would not have the book of Luke or the book of Acts. Wow. And Luke helped Paul a lot as he had some health challenges and was a doctor on the way. As we'll see in the last bit of Acts 16 we're about to read, is the other thing is they enter into Europe. And the first co converts from Europe end up becoming Christians. So many other doors open because of one door that God closed. And if we realize that as we go through our lives, when doors shut, we can actually be excited about that. Well, God, I thought this was the way, but clearly it's not, so you must have something better in mind. I'm excited to see what you're going to do now instead. And here's the thing, too, is that later on, Paul and them would go on a third mission trip. And on that one, they actually do end up going into Bithynia and traveling through that area more. And sometimes it's just a matter of trusting and surrendering to God's timing. Right? There might be a certain job you want, God saying 10 years from now, not one year from now. Right? There might be a relationship you want, and God saying three years from now, not three months from now. Right? Sometimes surrendering is, is God saying no, and sometimes it's God saying wait. And us being willing to accept God's no's, but also being willing to wait. What we can be grateful for is that as long as you are seeking God's will and doing things His way, you can trust Him with how things do turn out. And if you end up with a different career than you thought you were going to, here's what you can have is peace and go, you know what, God? This must be better than what I thought was going to be better. Right? If your relationship doesn't work or you end up staying single, you can trust God. You know what, God? I must be more content this way than if I got that thing I thought that I wanted. 
you really trust God, then, then you can be surrendered believing that this was, this was better than what I thought. Does that make sense? Yeah. 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 So plan your best, but remember that God's way is always better. And we find His will through surrender. And so third and finally, you guys still with me here? Yeah. yeah. We find God's will through seeking it. Amen. Right? God's will does not automatically come to us. God has plans for everyone, but they don't automatically happen. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. If they automatically happen, then no one would sin and everybody would be a perfect Christian, right? God has plans, but we have to seek after those. We have to go after finding what His will is. God's will is found through actively seeking to know it and actively choosing to do it. Our world is full of sayings that show that people are looking to understand the bigger picture. You know, things are said like, hey, everything happens for a reason, right? That doesn't mean everything should have happened. There's things that shouldn't have happened, things that God wouldn't have wanted to happen. But people saying that is window into trying to make sense of life and something being behind it, right? People going to uh, horoscopes, maybe, or going to palm reading and different things like that. And I'm just asking, what makes you trust this that's more reliable than trusting God? Right. Like, why is this seemingly, you know, probably because it's funner or more interesting, right? And they're not going to have to repent and totally change their lives like going to God. But, you know, things like good and bad luck, Karma. All of this is people trying to make sense of uh, connecting with that there's something else at play going on behind our lives. Right? A lot of things that we hear said in life or maybe in shows and music, uh, movies and stuff is, oh, the universe set this up. Who's the universe? <laughs> you know, when I think about this, and I think the universe is just God's politically correct name now. Just admit it. You're saying God set this up. God is behind this. Right? What's, what's the basis of these different things? And I think it's a lot more reliable to put our basis on God than any of these other things. But the truth is people say and look at this stuff because there's a desire to know and to understand, well, what is some divine will for my life? What should I be doing? We, we feel the need innately for help with our lives in this way. And so we get the joy of knowing that the real answer is God and to help other people to find that. Does that make sense? Yeah. We're going to close out here with Acts 16, verse 11 to 14. And this is an amazing story here. And it shows us that we should be seeking to find God's will in the ways that we'll talk about. In Acts 16, verse 11, it says, From Troas we put out to sea and sailed straight for Samothrace. And the next day we went to Antoniapolis. From there we traveled to Philippi a Roman colony in the leading city of that district of Macedonia. Do you like the book of Philippians? Yes. If God didn't reroute them, they wouldn't have planted the church in Philippi, we wouldn't have that letter. A Roman colony in the leading city of that district of Macedonia. As we stayed there, and we stayed there several days. On the Sabbath, we went outside the city gate to the river, where we expected to find a place of prayer. We sat down and began to speak to the women who had gathered there. One of those listening was a woman from the city of Theatira named Lydia, a dealer in purple cloth. She was a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart to respond to Paul's message. When she and the members of her household were baptized, she invited us to her home. If you consider me a believer in the Lord, she said, come and stay at my house. And she persuaded us. Now this is a beautiful story here. And I hope what you've seen through these whole 15 verses we read today is that it's filled with people seeking and deciding to follow God's will. And one of the people that happens with here is this woman, Lydia. Lydia is a successful, wealthy businesswoman. She's in the top of her society. We know this because she was a dealer of purple cloth and purple ink was incredibly expensive, like NYU. All right. But she was missing... <laughs> She was missing the purpose for her life. But God knew her heart. And she knew disciples were coming her way. So God, in His will, set up this interaction between them. And because of it, and because she was following God's will, and they were following God's will, she is baptized, she influences her family to get baptized, and then immediately she's hospitable, using 
her wealth and what God has given her to serve the church and to give to others. And she is an amazing example. But God set this up. Yeah. And what's amazing is that last night, yesterday, God set up another young woman named Lydia to become a Christian. Yesterday, Mark's little sister, Lydia, was baptized into Christ. Yeah. sharing and just how much led up to this moment. All of the people that followed God's will. Her story was such an amazing one of realizing that God does have plans for our life. Yeah. And if we follow them, we will see them. Yeah. You know, Mark's parents were just in a staples and reached out to by a stranger. Wow. They came to church, were baptized while Mark was in his mom's belly. She was pregnant with him. Mark, you know, grows up around the church, becomes a Christian. His brother Brett grows up, becomes a Christian because of that. But his parents also decided along the way to adopt their daughter Lydia from China. And of all of the people in a very large country for them to adopt, God set them up with Lydia. For this to be their daughter, their sister, who one day God knew would grow up and her heart would be open to the gospel to become a Christian as well. Amen. And the icing on the cake is that yesterday when she got baptized is the same date that Mark's parents got baptized. Oh. Isn't that crazy? Like, you couldn't plan that no matter how much you got paid, right? <laughs> like, that is just God is. working things out and people following His will. Amen. You know, like Lydia in the Bible and this Lydia, <laughs> rather than being stubborn, Rather than being self-reliant, we must allow God to open our heart to His will. Seek His will. You know, like Paul and company, rather than just, hey, go, go, go. No, they said, hey, we got to go get some time to pray. We need to seek out a place of prayer so that we could stay connected with God. Because if we're connected with God through prayer, seeking God in prayer, we'll be a lot more in tune with, well, what is God's will for my day? Going down to pray, I'm sure, made them more spiritually minded to decide to reach out to this woman, Lydia, Amen. that was down at the river as well. You know, I love uh, this idea of seeking God's will and how it does apply to the mission. Because we can believe, no, God does set up people's times and right. places. Come on, Rob. Right? Someone, they were going down to the river to pray for something else, but this woman was there. You might go in down to, be going down to campus or to work or somewhere else, but God might be setting up a time and a place for someone else. Someone on your route, your campus, next to you in class, they might be praying, they might be a person with an open heart, and you are God's answer. And so we should be seeking to bring God's will to others. This week I was super inspired by many of you out there sharing your faith. And somebody I want to lift up is Gigi. You know, Gigi really wanted to... Mr. Strong planting a lot of seeds. So Gigi set a goal before God. She said, I want to invite a hundred people to come out this week. Friday, Gigi was on her way to our leaders meeting before our event, and she was at 99 people. And so Gigi prayed to God, and she said, God, put somebody on the subway with me who will be open, just somebody who's obviously a college student that I could share my faith with. She was seeking God's will by going to God in prayer. And so what happens? Gigi's sitting on the subway, and this, this girl gets on the subway train wearing a bunch of Columbia clothes. Oh. <laughs> Gigi sees her and goes, okay, God, have her come sit by me. She walks over and sits down right next to Gigi. <laughs> At that point, you've got to open your mouth, right? <laughs> so Gigi shares her faith with her. She was interested. She gave Gigi her info so they could connect more. And this is just an example of somebody seeking God's will, going to God in prayer, and then God setting up these opportunities. Right. You know, I do want to make an important point here. That it's important to seek God's will, to figure out, well, what is God's will? Because it's very possible for us to do something that isn't God's will. You're not just automatically doing, just because something happened doesn't mean that's what God wanted to happen. Does that make sense? Yeah. Isaiah 30, verse 1, God says, Woe to the obstinate children, declares the Lord. To those who carry out plans that are not mine, forming an alliance, but not by my spirit, heaping sin upon sin. This verse tells us that it's possible for us to do things that are not God's will, that are not God's plan. 
Not everything that happens is God's will. Everything that happens God allowed, but not everything happens is something that God wanted right. or that God made happen or will. Here's something. Sin is never God's will. Right. Right. No sin in your life or that you've experienced or you see in the world has anything to do with God's will. Right? Sin is living obstinately to God's will. It's actually the opposite. And this verse says that it brings woe. It brings sorrow, distress, or troubles. And we need to consider the sorrow, distress, and trouble that we've seen in our own lives or in the world because of sin. And we need to realize that those things are there because of sin, not because of God. It's actually there because people didn't seek and obey God. And so here's our options. Because a lot of times people understand, well, why do bad things happen? And for many situations, the answer is sin. People not doing God's will is what leads to a lot of the wrong that happens in our lives and in this world. And so our options are either God controls everything and we have no free will and there's no sin, or we have free will and there is sin, but we have the option to choose to follow God and be led away from that. What I love about God's plan is that as he does give us free will and we choose to follow Jesus and not sin, at the end of this, he has a place prepared for us called heaven, where we can live eternity eternally without the option to sin and only God's will will be followed. And so we should make every effort to be there. Now I want to close out uh, this lesson just giving you a handful of practicals on how to seek God's will as you make decisions. And then we'll uh, close out taking communion. I'll get to this verse in a second. Here's just a few quick things you could write down. How to seek God's will as you make decisions. One, as you're figuring it out, ask yourself, just make part of your process to pause and ask yourself, well, what do I think Jesus would do in this position? Amen. Or how would Jesus decide this? And to really think about that. And the, the reality is, and I hope this makes sense to you, I don't have time to go much into it, there might not always be just one answer. Right? You might have two job opportunities and you're seeking God's will. Sometimes maybe one is what is it. Sometimes maybe God's okay with either job. And you're trying to figure out which one. And God's like, hey, honestly, they're both great. Just do it for me, serve me with it, and keep me first. Right. Where should I live? Should I live here or move there? Maybe both are good options. Sometimes we have a lot of stress trying to figure out which one option. And sometimes, you know, like I'm a dad, right? And I do have a will for my kids, but a lot of it is a little bit generic. In, in some ways, I'm like, hey, I want them to grow up and be able to support and take care of themselves. If it was as a teacher or it was, you know, as, uh, you know, an NJ Transit driver or whatever, I'm like, hey, either one of those is okay with me. I'm not like, it's got to be this one. But really what my will is, is that they take care of themselves, right? right? That they still have a good relationship with Chelsea and I. So as you're figuring out God's will for your life, just take some stress off of finding the one right answer. But remember, most of what God's will is at the end of the day is that, hey, are you still going to love him? Right. Are you still going to love others? Are you still going to be devoted to his church? Are you still going to be on the mission? Are you going to use your gifts for him? Mm -hmm. Right. That's ultimately the things God cares about most in our life is that stuff. And then where we live, what job we have, who we date. God does have some will for those things, obviously, but with some of it, I think there's some flexibility. Does that make sense? Yeah. So try to ask, well, what would Jesus do in this situation? And what can help us figure that out, this is the second practical, is digging into the Bible, looking to the Word of God. Here's a biblical principle. God's will, God's plans for your life will never contradict or compromise Scripture. So if something contradicts or compromises the Bible, you can know that must not be God's will. Which then you can know, so then that must not be what's best. And then you go, well, God, show me what is best because it must be something different than I thought or something else. Another way we can find God's will is obviously to pray and to sometimes even fast about it. To end that prayer, to ask God to guide you where he wants you. And I do think as we slow down and pray and fast, we can start to hear better what it is that God wants for us. And with both of those things, the more regularly you immerse yourself in the word and in prayer, the more in touch with the Holy Spirit you are going to be, 
And the more ready and, and able you're going to be to discern, well, what is the Spirit's will? What is God's will as you become more and more a person of prayer and of Bible study? Amen. A fourth thing that can help you find God's will is to seek advice, to seek godly counsel, to surround yourself with spiritual companions who are, you are influenced by and get guidance from. You know, Paul was not out there by himself. We all need a spiritual team of people to go through life with. Amen? Amen. And the last thing I want to mention before we take communion, and that's what this verse is up here for, is to not overly worry or get stuck thinking too far ahead. Think about the future, plan for the future, but remember that your life is ultimately just a mist that appears and vanishes. Right? And what's most important for us is to live today for God. To seek, well, what is God's will for my life right now? And as we take life step by step, then God will guide us and lead us one step at a time. Amen? Amen. You know, as you think about your life, there really are, and you're young, we're all young here, there are really, in a lot of ways, two trajectories. You could go according to your will or the world's will, or you could choose to go according to God's will. And let's remember that God's will, His way, is the way that is good, pleasing, and perfect. And so, we're going to take communion at this time. You can raise your hand if you need a communion cup. You know, this morning, I hope you can appreciate how much God does care about you and the fact that He does have good, pleasing, and a perfect will for your life. And I hope that you will choose God's will in your life through selflessness, through surrender, and through seeking it. And so, as we take communion, let's remember that none of us can even have God's good, pleasing, and perfect will if Jesus wasn't willing to go to the cross for us. Isaiah 53, verse 10, says, Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life an offering for sin, he will see his offspring, he'll see us, and prolong his days. And the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's go to God in prayer as we all decide to seek God's will for our life. Good morning, Father. Uh, thank you so much, God, that you care about us enough to have a will and to have a plan for our lives. God, you could easily, you're, you're holy, you're awesome, you're mighty, you're powerful, God. We are not. We are sinners. We are little. God, we are weak. And it would be easy for you to not care or not have a plan. And yet, God, you are love. And you made us. And so you do love us. You do have a will for us, God. You do have a plan for our lives. And God, I'm so grateful that ultimately your will for us was to forgive us, was to save us, was to change us, to change our eternity, to do life with us, to give us an eternity in heaven with you one day. God, thank you so much that you do have a good, pleasing, and perfect will for us. And thank you that you've not left us to guess and to wonder, but that you gave us your spirit. You gave us your word. You gave us the ability to pray, to be part of a spiritual community that we can try to figure out what your will is, what will please you, and what will be best for us in our lives. But God, I do want to thank you for Jesus, because we know that if he wasn't willing to go to the cross, none of us would find your will for our lives. Thank you that he was willing to suffer. Thank you that it was part of your will, your plan, to cause him to suffer instead of us. God, I pray that each one of us would reflect on that and that in view of your mercy, in view of the cross, in view of your grace, every one of us would decide to give our life as a living sacrifice to you. And in doing so, in living for you, I pray that each of us would find your good, pleasing, and perfect will. Amen. Amen.